Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, may we always be open to the words that you have for us, especially when those words are spoken by those we might normally set aside or ignore. Amen. I was going to say, I, hope, I was hoping the praise team wasn't going to stand there the whole sermon. <laughs> You're like, oh, i got to hurry. <clears throat> so, as many of you are already aware, I think, I, I love bringing up the Magnificat. That is uh, the term for the words of Mary that I read this morning, that hopefully we read this morning. I love bringing it up every chance that I get. Uh, I honestly think it's one of the most important passages in all of Scripture. One of the reasons I say this is because it's one of the few times in Scripture that we get to hear a woman's voice at all. There are a couple other instances I could think of. Uh, Deborah, we read about not that long ago. Miriam in Exodus uh, gets a triumphant song. Um, But we very rarely get to read the words of any women in scripture. And so when we do find those words, I think that it's appropriate that we should listen much harder than we normally do and give those words extra attention. I also like bringing it up because it's amazing how many people who are who otherwise feel knowledgeable about scripture don't know what I'm talking about when I mention it or and have never read these words or skim past them to find other things. There are people who can quote for me, step by step, the Romans road uh, that people have found in the book of Romans. But when I bring up the Magnificat, recently I literally got scolded by someone for bringing up something that was Catholic and not Christian. I just thought, oh man, (laughs) I guess I'll keep talking about the Magnificat then. (laughs) There's work to do. We know a little bit about what Joseph thought. Uh, around the birth of Christ. Not much. We know what the angels thought about that event. We know a little bit about what the shepherds thought about what was happening. A little bit after Christmas, we're going to hear about what some Persian wizards thought. That'll be cool. But there are people who know all the verses of We Three Kings, but don't know that Mary spoke prophetically about the Incarnation. So today, I'm going to focus on Mary's words and go through them and see what it is that we find. We begin with kind of an extended introduction with with Mary rejoicing. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. This is a joyous introduction from Mary, and it's so interesting to me because it presumes God's victory. It presumes God's success. It doesn't say what God plans to do. It talks about what to her God has already done. So to Mary, the arrival of Jesus is something that she understands as accomplishing something decisive in the world. It's not a prelude, but it's a glorious conclusion to promises that had been made generations ago. It's not an ending, but it's a new beginning for her and for everyone around her. And so... Her response is to rejoice. She continues, God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. It's normal for the proud not to reckon God's strength in comparison to their own. Much less do the proud lean on God's strength. 
It's pride that tells us that we can survive alone. It's pride that tells us that we can earn what we need in the world and earn what it is that we have. Pride tells us that we are independent. We make our own future. Pride tells us that when it goes well, it's because we are good people who work hard. And when it goes poorly, it's because we are bad people or we're lazy or we've done something wrong. That viewpoint is utterly absurd. Despite that, we hold it very commonly. But it's an absurd viewpoint. It doesn't hold up to even the slightest bit of scrutiny. I mean, think about it. The world is chock full of wealthy, powerful, awful people. And the world is just teeming with good-hearted, virtuous, generous, but vulnerable people. You'd have to be utterly blind not to notice this. And also, vice versa. Vulnerable people who are kind of awful. And wealthy, powerful people who seem to be good-hearted. The thing is, you don't get any credit for winning, nor do you get blame for losing what is fundamentally a rigged game. And it's interesting that a person of faith can say in the same breath, the world is fallen and struggles to follow any of God's decrees, and in the same breath say, but God has blessed me with success in that world. Are you sure that was God who brought you success? In a fallen world governed by sinful impulses and selfishness and cruelty and greed? Are you sure that's what God's blessing looks like in that world? One thing we see consistently is that when God arrives, the proud scatter. Because they come face to face with true strength and it's terrifying. And so when God is present, the only people who are left hanging around are the humble. Mary continues, He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. There's a hymn, one of my favorites, The Canticle of the Turning. And uh, I actually, we played the hymn and I sung it at my ordination. It was one of the songs I used for my ordination service uh, 10 years ago. Actually, I have my patch for my mother's ordination day on one side of this stole. And then I have a patch for my ordination day on the other, April 11th, 2010. Recently had my 10th anniversary of ordination, which was Interesting, I'm finally at a place where I've been a pastor for longer than I was a barista, uh, which is cool. But the canticle of the turning says it this way, that God's justice tears every tyrant from their throne. And I think of this as applying to all the tyrants, ranging from the playground to the break room to the boardroom to the tyrants who seek to rewrite history with violence. Tyrants invariably think either that God is on their side or that God does not matter. Mary says that neither of those is true. God matters and is not on your side. But rather that the fate of every tyrant from petty to grandiose is ruin. At the same time, the lowly are lifted up. The last are first. Those who have been pushed to the edges in a society, in the presence of Christ, they are brought to the center. Whether we're talking about the poor or the disabled or the sick or the unclean or the stranger or the enemy, those are the people in the center of the kingdom of God. So Mary reminds us that when a tyrant is thrown down, When the oppressed and marginalized are lifted up, that is the work of Christ in the world. That was the work of Christ in the world from the very beginning, before Christ was even born. 
And we can see Christ at work every time we see a tyrant brought low or a vulnerable person lifted up. Mary continues, He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So for those of us who have more than we need in the world, we have, as Christ says, received our consolation. There's nothing more for us. This is a fallen world, and some people benefit from that. Whether you're a prophet of Baal in the ancient world or an investment manager now, this fallen world works out well for some of us. So congratulations on our success. Well done. But Christ doesn't come into the world to give us even more. Christ is here to feed the hungry. Was from the very beginning. And if we are not hungry, or if we are not aware of our hunger, then maybe Christ has nothing for us. The kingdom of God is the inverse of the way things usually work. Normally, the rich are filled with good things and the poor are sent away empty. That's what it means to be rich and poor. What it means to be rich is you are filled with good things. What it means to be poor is you are sent away empty. Trillions in tax cuts and corporate subsidies, no problem but we'll have to cut food stamps and social services to pay for it. Got to balance the budget. This callous logic is always the same, whether you're talking about the Bronze Age or the Digital Age. It doesn't change. Mary concludes, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors to Abraham and to his descendants forever. None of the things I've spoken about are accidental or unexpected. If someone is a student of the prophetic word of Scripture, we lit the candle of joy this morning for our service which may have seemed early to some who are keeping track, but I have been taking the theme for each candle from the reading, the psalm reading in the lectionary for that Sunday. And this Sunday, the psalm reading and the reading from Isaiah and the reading from Luke were all about joy and rejoicing. And so today, we lit the candle of joy. And we read the words of Mary rejoicing So what is it that makes Mary rejoice? What is it that has caused people who otherwise don't value the words of women to keep sacred these words for the past 2,000 years? What is the cause for rejoicing? I think it is in brief that into Mary's world of violence and fear, tyranny, exploitation, her little child is born, and he will change everything. He has already changed everything. For the powerful, he brings an end to their power. For the weak, he is God's strength wielded for them. We too live in a world of violence and fear, tyranny and exploitation. And if we long to see that world overturned, then Christ is a joy for us as well. We can rejoice that Christ is born and that this world is being turned upside down. If we love this world because of the benefits that it happens to bring some of us, then this season is a time to decide where we stand 
in relation to this child. Because his arrival is certain, and so is his victory. Amen.